Good morning. It's good to be here with you. It truly is a beautiful place. We've really enjoyed uh, all that we have seen. And unfortunately, now I'm going to do something to that because I'm going to talk about not beautiful things all morning, uh, which, as you know, exist in this world as much as the beauty does and sometimes seem to swallow it up and let us sort of lead us to forget about the beauty. So we live in a numbing world and between the media tsunami and all the things that we read in the digital world, um, I think that we sometimes get overwhelmed and tune things out. So I'm gonna start this morning by asking you to marshal uh, your minds and bring them in so that you can go with me into this world of trauma and grief and learn and listen in ways that are helpful to you as individuals, I hope, but also helpful to you as you care for and serve others. We have things like natural disasters, genocides, such as in Rwanda, child soldiers, wars. Currently, all our eyes are on Ukraine and what's happening there. All of these things lead to traumatized human beings. We also have systemic violence in our own countries, our own cities, our own churches, and our own so-called Christian homes. Those also lead to trauma. According to Amnesty International, just to give you some sense of how rampant trauma is, one in three females are beaten or coerced into sex or otherwise abused in their lifetime. One in three females worldwide. You think about that the next time you walk through a shopping area or sit in church. More girls have been killed in the last 50 years simply because they are girls. More girls have been killed in the last 50 years than men who have been killed in all the battles that we have known about. According to the UN accounts, in some places, three quarters of females have been raped. And that is done with the intent of disfiguring and torturing those women in order to terrorize not only them, but the general population. It's a power play used for control and subjection, not just of women, but of the population in the region. And please do not think that such horrors only happen to women or girls alone. In the United States, the number of men raped in a year is zero. The estimated number of men actually raped, according to the Department of Justice, is 93,000. Rape and sexual abuse organizations have reported recently an increase in men beginning to seek help for such things. Boys born to ethnic minorities who are poor and raised in homes without a father are at much greater risk. In the sixth grade, in the United States, the rate of using alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, and IV drugs was 25 to 50 times higher for boys who had been sexually abused. So often we, of course, look at the problems that arise, such as drug ab abuse and things like that, but we don't understand what the foundation of that is. Abused boys have 12 times the normal rate of suicide. They go on to have higher rates of mental illness. And if you uh, look at men who have been diagnosed with mental illness, 40% report childhood sexual abuse. So all of these things, from natural disasters to genocide to rape and abuse, things that we find difficult to comprehend, do not want to hold in our minds, do not want to be true, are happening to precious human beings. They result in traumatized human beings. They live with the recurring, tormenting memories of atrocities witnessed and personally born. It infects their sleep with nightmares, destroys their relationships, hinders their capacity to work or study, torments their emotions, and shatters their faith and mutilates their hope. 
trauma is indeed extraordinary, not because it rarely occurs, but because of the way that it overwhelms normal human coping. It swallows up and destroys normal human ways of living and learning. The usual response to an atrocity of any kind, of course, is to try and remove it from the mind, push it aside, cover it up, and ignore it. Those who have been traumatized want to flee the memory of the occurrence. And we who hear it want to flee also. We find it too terrible to remember and too incomprehensible to put into words, which is why we often use the phrase unspeakable atrocities. The great tension is the futile attempt to forget the unspeakable, while it continues to live on and often scream in the mind. And that push-pull between the need to forget and the need to remember is the central dialectic of trauma. And that tension is not experienced only by individuals and families. It is also experienced by churches and entire nations. It is experienced not only by the traumatized, but by those who bear witness to their story. I know something of this tension, because as a psychologist, I have spent 50 years working with child abuse, rape, and violence of many kinds, including combat, genocide, and trafficking. I have seen the push-pull in my clients who are terrified to remember and speak, but who cannot forget. I have seen families, churches, cities, and yes, even nations such as Rwanda deny the existence of evil and trauma in their midst, as well as its life-shaping impact. I also know that this tension exists in those who bear witness. You know, we see something on the television or on the internet and someone tells about an atrocity and soon after that, what do we do? We look for ways to remove it from our minds. Such stories threaten our comfort, our position, or our system. And the stories are vile and messy and very disruptive to our lives. Traumatized people need attention and assistance, often for a long time. The trauma memories of our families and institutions and organizations get buried, and geographical distance pushes it away and if you're watching it on the television or something, all you have to do is push a button to make it go away. We are, however, you and I, the body of Christ. And that means the body of Christ who is our head. And in the physical world, we know that if a body can't do what a head says for some reason, that means it's very sick. The same is true in the spiritual realm. We are his people. We are his body. And I believe with all my heart that he has called us to go out of ourselves and follow him into the suffering of this world, bearing his character and living in the flesh, his word. And we do go. We send missionaries, we teach the scriptures, we provide food and clean water and education, all sorts of things, and we should. But I fear that we are just beginning to see trauma as a place of service. If we think carefully about the extensive natural disasters in the world, such as earthquakes and tsunamis and things, and combine those with victims of war and violent inner cities and genocide, and abuse and trafficking, the number is staggering. I believe that if we would stop and look out on suffering humanity, we would begin to realize that trauma is perhaps the greatest mission field in this century. Several years ago, I was invited to Ghana to speak uh, for a conference about violence against women and children. And while there, my hostess took me to visit the Cape Coast Castle on, uh, on the coast of Ghana, which um, is a large stone fort from a long time ago. And in that place, hundreds of thousands of Africans were forced through its dungeons and out through the door of no return onto slave ships. There were five dungeons in the castle for males, 
And descending down into the utter darkness of one of those dungeons was a very claustrophobic feeling. 200 men, shackled and chained together, stayed in that dungeon for about three months before being shipped across the Atlantic. We stood in one of the male dungeons listening in the darkness to the whole horrific story when our guide said this, do you know what is above the dungeon? Of course, we shook our heads, no. The chapel, he said, directly above 200 shackled men, some of them dead already, many of them screaming, all of them sitting in film, sat God worshipers. They sang, they read the scriptures, they prayed, I suppose they took up some sort of offering to help people who needed it. The slaves could actually hear the service. The worshipers could sometimes hear the slaves, though they had people down there with them to make them behave so as not to disturb church. I took my breath away. The evil, the suffering, the humiliation, and the injustice caused by those worshiping in the chapel was overwhelming, and the visual parable was quite stunning. The people in the chapel were numb to the horrific trauma and suffering. Beneath them, suffering they had created for profit. Under the form of worship in that uh, chapel in Ghana, lay the darkness of slavery, oppression, and tyranny, all things that blight and destroy human beings, precious human beings who've been created in the image of God. But I think you know that Christianity does not truly look like being folded up with evil and worshiping on top of dungeons. The following Christ does not look like complicity with a system that butters our bread and fills our coffers on the backs of those who were created in the image of our God. It does not look like praying and singing and giving money on top of screams and unspeakable filth and death. Our guide pointed up to the chapel and said, heaven above, hell below. But I would argue that heaven was not above because that is not what heaven does. And it is what heaven actually does that is the reason you and I are here. Heaven leaves the chapel and brings, goes down into the dungeon, yes, in order to bring out those who have been enslaved into light and freedom so they, in turn, can go back down and bring out more. God has sowed his life in you and in me. In the midst of this dark and fallen world filled with ruined humanity, he has sown his life in us and thrust us out. God has, however, made it very clear that the enemy has sown seed as well, and it is also growing and maturing right in there with the wheat. It is so, he said, and he says that it will be so until he returns. The Cape Coast castles were hidden under the chapel. They were not out in the open. They were covered. They were carrying precious human beings. They were not in a separate building. It was all there together. And our God has called you and I not to ignore the dungeons in or around or just outside our sanctuaries. And that's why we're here today. The problem, you see, is that trauma does not usually stop without intervention, and it cannot heal without being spoken. And it needs to be spoken and it needs to be heard in the context of a safe relationship where the dignity of the one who has been crushed by the trauma is restored. And that requires the presence of another human being. And that means we have to go and we have to listen and be present to the truth of the evil, impacted by it, and respond with honor and love. Having to enter into those things we would most, most like to ignore. But isn't that, in fact, what our Lord did for us? He left glory and came down to this traumatized world. And oh, how he listened. He became flesh like us. 
He literally got in our skin. He was fully present to the truth of this groaning creation and was eternally impacted by its evil and suffering. He sat with us and bestowed honor to crushed human beings, you and me, and reached out in love. He did not flee the atrocities of our world or of our hearts and minds. He is, in fact, the crucified one. Another way to say that is he is, in fact, the traumatized one. Work with the traumatized does not fit in easily into the neat little programs we sometimes arrange in our churches. There is no quick success. The numbers are not astounding, but one by one. But it is the way our Lord went. And I long for the church of Jesus Christ to capture this vision and enter in. Traumatized people are desperate. The doors are open and they are starving for help for their minds and their souls. The key is to let ourselves truly see what is there and not flee the atrocities and the devastated lies, lives which we would prefer to ignore and not be disturbed by. When our God interfaces with this world, he leaves the higher and descends. He leaves beauty and enters chaos. He leaves pure and he goes into filthy. He demonstrates that our God does not just speak words but also acts first in the heart of the, of the dungeons of human beings and then through the lives of those same people into the dungeons of the world. Jesus demonstrated in the flesh the character of God and his people, you, me, are to do the same in this world. We are to demonstrate his character. And when God's people worship over and separate and untouched by the du dungeons, they are not worshiping the God of the scriptures. They've made up a different one. There is nothing in the scriptures to suggest that being complicit with trauma, ignoring it, uncaring, death, is a, is a godly thing to do. Those scriptures do say that the dungeons of the Cape Coast castle were below first because they were present in the heart of those running that castle. So how are we to respond to the traumatized? Well, let's consider what it means to live with trauma memories. Some of you know this quite personally. Others of you know it from walking with someone. Anyone with trauma memories wants them to go away. And if they cannot make them disappear, they at least want to forget them somehow and to hide it from themselves. Those who try to hide or forget what they know in terms of the experience of trauma find that it continues to break through into their consciousness. Here's a quote from a trauma survivor. I live beside it. It is right there, fixed, unchangeable, wrapped in the tough skin of memory but separates itself from the present me. I wish the skin to become tough, for I fear it will grow thinner and crack, permitting the trauma to spill out and capture me. Here's another quote. My head is filled with garbage. All those images, you know, and sounds, and my nostrils are filled with smells, you can't cut it out. It's like another skin beneath your skin and you cannot shed it. I am not like you. You have one vision of life. I have two. I have a double life. The woman who said these things was a survivor of the Nazi Holocaust. And what she has described here is a very common experience for people who have experienced trauma. She tries to forget remove from her mind this thing that she doesn't want to face, but it continues to live constantly beside her, and she's always afraid that it's going to reach out and grab her, which it often does. You cannot erase trauma memories. Psychologist Bruno Bettelheim said this, what cannot be talked about can also not be put to rest. And if it is not, the wound continues to fester from generation to generation. 
And I'm sure many of you know that experience in your own families or in families of people that you have worked with or walked with, that the trauma goes down through the generations. Following a traumatic experience, every human being has to make the heartbreaking adjustment to a new world full of losses, one they didn't know existed, one they hoped to avoid. So you could be five years old and be traumatized, 35, 55, but it will change you. Trauma involves an event that threatens life or physical safety. It takes away choice and it results in overwhelming fear that does not leave. This includes things like violence, rape, sexual abuse, physical abuse. And when these things happen to human beings, they feel utterly alone, helpless, humiliated, and hopeless. Following trauma, people turn inward, away from life, because the memories and the feelings are all they can handle at one time. It's not wrong. It's necessary for a while. However, eventually, if life is to go on, the person must return to the outside world. What kinds of things are needed to help a traumatized person face what has occurred and what it has done to them inside? What is needed for them to remember well and truly, be able to speak truth in safety, and yet over time, find a way to return to a life that does also include good. Recovery involves a reversal of the experience of trauma. Trauma brings silence because there are no words to adequately describe what's happened. Trauma brings emotional darkness and isolation because it feels like no one cares and no one could possibly understand what happened to you. Trauma makes time stand still because we got so lost in what happened, we can't go forward. And we have lost our hope. So there are three main things that must occur to reverse this and bring about recovery. All three have to happen. It can't be just one. Won't be enough. And the three things are some very ordinary sounding things. One is talking. One is tears. And one is time. So let's look at each one. Obviously, talking is a part of being human, yes? It's how God made us. He meant for us to talk. He meant for us to express ourselves, to dialogue together with him and with each other. When someone does not or cannot talk, something is broken. There may be something physically wrong, or there may be deep emotional wounds. Sometimes when people do not talk, at all, or do not talk about a particular experience or event in their lives, it is because the pain is so great that they cannot find words to express it. Or they just keep saying, uh, and this is very common with trauma survivors, they keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. They keep trying to find the words that will really express what it is, and nothing is sufficient. Talking is absolutely necessary for recovery. Even though words are inadequate, they must be spoken. To remain silent is to fail to honor the event and the memory. And by honoring it, I mean speaking the truth about it, saying what really happened, saying it was really evil, and saying that it really did damage. It dishonors victims when we are silent about their experience or we pretend it did not occur or that it is not important and they can just forget about it and go on. Trauma says, I am here. What happened was wrong. I am damaged. Justice is needed and so is care for my broken heart. That's what talking gives to trauma victims. At the beginning, talking is sometimes not able to be done using words. So I have often found that people who are completely overwhelmed uh, by a particular trauma, for example, working with some people in Rwanda who lived through the genocide there, they can't speak. What they can do is moan or move their body, sigh, cry, scream. But it is the beginning of finding your voice. 
It's not words, but it's voice. <coughs> Many times, people need to sit with us in silence. It is a way of joining with them so they are not alone in the act of struggling to find words. Just because they can't talk doesn't mean they aren't working to find words. And having someone with you, even though you can't speak, is a gift. Eventually, of course, words must come. And sometimes people need help with that. So sometimes I might do something like when somebody has no words for something. I say, okay, I'm going to say a word. And all you have to do is go yes or no. Not out loud, just nod. If the word fits and if it doesn't. And so I will come up with words. Terrifying, whatever. You make them up and you begin to form something and help them find words for what they're feeling. So you might use words like horrifying or dark or alone or overwhelming or helpless or hopeless or whatever. Little by little, you help them find words until you can get pieces of their story. Can you take three of those words and put them together in a sentence that might describe for you and me what happened to you? Trauma stories do not come out neatly with a beginning, a middle, and an end. They come out in broken pieces. They come out disordered and often unclear. Talking is about telling the truth. It connects the victim, the survivor, to another person. So they're all of a sudden not completely isolated with what happened. Somebody else is actually present to hearing the story. It restores dignity because what you're saying is your story matters. And when you, when you speak, I am listening and I am with you. Again, it is the reversal of what happened during the trauma, which was unjust, violent often, abusive. All of those things teach us lies. And so speaking begins to formulate the truth into words. Such events suggest we are of value, that we matter. Trauma says we are worthless. Trauma tells the, uh, talking tells the truth and gives dignity because the person and their story both matter, as does the impact of those things. Violence and abuse disconnect us from caring relationships. We are alone. We are tossed aside. We are silenced. Telling the trauma story gives a place of connection with another human being, which gives you dignity and value and someone who will enter your story with you, which means you are no longer completely alone in that story. So trauma recovery requires talking, and it means talking often about the same thing over and over and over again. It's not a one-time shot. Second thing that is often, uh, re that is required for trauma healing is tears. I expect all of us in here have shed tears somewhere along the way. Many have had the experience, I'm sure, of wanting to cry sometimes and not feeling able to. It gets stuck somehow. Um, and probably some of you, or maybe many of you, have had the experience of someone telling you as a child or later, you shouldn't cry. You don't need to cry, whatever. Trauma recovery requires tears. It's grieving. Facing a new world full of losses. Whatever it was before, it'll never be again. It'll never be a world where you have not been traumatized. That produces grief. So many emotions are often companions of trauma. Fear, sadness, isolation, humiliation, anger. Those are strong emotions, and a lot of them, all of us would just as soon do without in our lives. They're not feelings we want. But like words, they must be expressed. Feelings tell the story just like words tell the story. They just do it a bit differently. Feelings express what the trauma did to the victim, just like blood shows that there's a cut on your hand. Tears are the blood. It's like seeing and acknowledging a physical wound after an accident. For many people, words come first. Choosing words, saying words, having someone listen and honor them helps to strengthen the victim survivor to face the feelings. You have already have connected with somebody who's with you. The feelings are terrifying, and you know you're going to be flooded. 
So it connects them to a caring person that they have built trust with who will help them bear the terrifying feelings and not be alone in that place. Many victims try very hard not to feel anything. And they will often say things like, if I start crying, I'll never stop. Or if I feel the hopelessness, I'll fall into a black hole and I'll never get out. Many will try hard not to feel anything. And of course, sometimes people will do things like use alcohol and drugs to keep them numb. They think if they anesthetize themselves, they can keep the memories and feelings away. It doesn't work. When people do such things, they spend their whole lives controlled by the trauma because everything they're doing is about running away from it. It's just as much in charge as it was when it was occurring. It's very important for all of us to remember that telling a trauma story, facing the truth and expressing the deep and painful emotions that keep uh, company with trauma requires tremendous courage. That courage needs to be honored when someone begins to speak, no matter how hesitant or how little they speak. And the truth is that most people cannot face their trauma alone, nor that they shouldn't, and they're not equipped to. They need connection with someone who cares, someone who is patient, and someone who will bolster their courage to face the truth, not only of what happened, but how it has changed them. They need a companion in their lament. A companion in tragedy always helps us have courage. Many emotions cannot be adequately expressed in words, and so nonverbal ways are helpful. So I often ask people when they can't say anything about how they feel, I say, draw me a picture of what you feel like. And sometimes it's just scribbling, you know, like black on a piece of paper or something. But it's the beginning of beginning to say, how someone feels. Many years I saw a woman who was a ballerina and she had red hair that was about down to here and she had been horribly abused and uh, I, I was learning about her story and how she felt but she couldn't do the words at a certain point and so what she did was go home and create a dance to express how she felt. And when she came back to see me for her next appointment, she showed me the dance in the office. And at the end, she took that long hair and threw it over her face, which was an expression of the shame that she felt from what had been done to her. I didn't need words. I helped her find them, but you know, when watching <laughs> something like that without words gives you many words for what has happened. I also often encourage people to write their own laments. You know, I'll show them just a small piece of a lament, say, in the Psalms. There's a thing said in the Psalms, uh, uh, in the lament Psalms, that many of us in the Christian world, if we said them out loud in our own words, would be told you shouldn't talk like that <laughs> about God. So it's always a surprise to people to find out what lament Psalms are actually saying. So if you show them some small portion of some of those, then it helps them be able to express and lament what has happened to them. There's a, a verse in Psalms um, in chapter 56 that says this, and you just think about some of the tendencies in churches and Christian circles. Um, you, God, have taken account of my grieving and put my tears in a bottle. Now you save something in a bottle that's precious you're not throwing it away. And then it goes on to say, are my tears not also in your book, meaning God's book? He's recording our tears. It's a very important truth for trauma victims because it honors the feelings that they have often been told they shouldn't have, and if they had enough faith, they wouldn't have, which is not truth. So I, I, I find the lament psalms very helpful, and then I, people often will write their own lament psalms um, and realize that in expressing those things, it's not a sign of weakness. It's not a sign of lack of faith. It's truth that needs to be said, and God is recording them and keeping, it, keeping those tears in a bottle. He knows. He is not criticizing those tears. So we will help others in their recovery if we learn 
to be like him about their grief and their tears uh, and, and the fact that they don't have words and that those tears require tremendous courage to express. Um, many who are traumatized will be afraid to face and feel the feelings related to the trauma, the terror, the hopelessness, the nobody's coming to help me. And these fears are understandable for the feelings surrounding the trauma are very powerful and places where humans felt overwhelmed and helpless and none of us likes to remember that. So dealing with healing from such feelings does not occur easily and it's not quick. Feelings will alternate between numbness and exhaustion and the strong feelings. Walking with, not condemning, entering in is what is needed. You will find for many trauma survivors that there are often one or two specific memories that have become symbolic of the whole story. And sometimes we can figure that out just by listening well as somebody is talking and hearing about the memory or the part of memory they keep repeating. These segments represent the trauma in a bigger way than just the thing they're talking about. Um, Many years ago, I met with a man who grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia, terrible poverty and a lot of violence, not only on the streets, but in his home. And he um, was repeatedly raped growing up by his stepfather. So he, he had a time that he vividly remembered looking through the Venetian blinds in the living room one day and watching his mother walk down the street and the sidewalk. And he, he would talk to me, and, and I didn't understand until he began to tell me the story, but he sees life through the Venetian blinds. And he, he said he didn't know it at the time, but the moment of watching her through the blinds walk down the street was the great moment of his utter abandonment to this stepfather who raped him all the time. She never came back. So he's eight years old and he walks and he said, life, I always feel like I'm looking at life through Venetian blinds, which of course I couldn't understand until I knew the story. So such symbolic memories often tell us the deeper, larger story. That was a real event that happened, but it was much bigger than that in him. And understanding it helped me understand him and how he functioned and where, why he didn't function in certain ways. Uh, this aspect of remembering also requires lamenting. You know, I, I think it's helpful, again, to use pieces from the Psalms, like Psalm 10 or 12 or 13. There are phrases in those laments. And so sometimes you can, I write them down for somebody, just a phrase that I think fits what they're feeling. And I have them go home and expand on it. And uh, it gives them a, like a step into something, number one, they don't want to feel, and number two, something many of them have been told is sinful to feel. One of the characteristics of dealing with trauma is the repetitious nature of the work. It's not like, well, we did this already, you should be okay. It's not how it works. <laughs> you did it, and you did it, and you did it, and you did it. Part of it is getting it in deeper. So sometimes uh, survivors, you'll find, will say the same things repetitively, you know, like, how could my father do that to me? And it's just over and over again. And the repetitions uh, come up also in the emotions, you know, like anger. I'm angry. I'm angry again. I'm angry at that. And the magnitude of the trauma you see is so great that repetition is necessary. Once it's not sufficient. Uh, the mind can't really imagine what happened, only it really did happen. It, it doesn't know how to hold the truth. And so repetition helps people learn how to hold the truth in a way that doesn't swallow them up all over again. Uh, you know, their struggles to integrate the trauma and all it did and still does to them into this life that they have, which you know, for many of them, they working, they have families, all those kinds of things, and there's no way to put it together. And so the repetition is part of how that begins to happen and how they learn to work toward their own healing by accepting that repetition and yet also knowing this part over here is also true. And that's part of what my work is, is to help them remember, yes, this was true, yes, you need to say it again, 
yes, this is true. You're sitting in my office and you're safe. Let that be true also. So it's both of those things that have to happen. And then there's a third thing that must occur for trauma recovery uh, to begin and to grow. And I hate to tell you, but the third thing you have absolutely no control over. And neither does your client or whoever you're working with, neither do I, because the third thing is time. It's gonna go one second at a time, and it doesn't matter how much pain you're in, it's still gonna go one second at a time. And so that's a very difficult thing. So trauma needs talking, it needs tears, but it also needs time. And that frustrates certainly many victims, and sometimes it frustrates caregivers. You know, we did this already. It, it should be done. It's not done. And it's something that will always have been part of their lives. And so uh, you, you have to remember that this thing <laughs> that is required, you just have to walk through and wait on. Um, expressing emotions and finding words for them and gaining mastery over them takes time. Telling the truth of an absolutely hideous, terrifying story takes time. You just get bits and then you get repetitious bits, and then another bit gets added on. It takes a lot of time. So uh, part of what you keep encouraging people to is look, what you're doing takes time. It also takes tremendous courage, and you're showing that. I will tell this story. I was told never to speak about this, and I'm speaking about it. I will look at this. I will talk back to it. But it takes time for those things to happen. So, uh, for the words to come, for them to be understood and incorporated into a person as being true, for the emotions to come, for the, the words used to say, this is what this did to me, this is what it's doing to me now, you know, it's still affecting me. I am hurt, I am in pain, I am afraid, I am angry, again and again and again. So walking through those things is a slow, hard pace. It's not done alone. And uh, people who have been traumatized often want it to be done alone because oftentimes, as I'm sure you know, a lot of trauma incur includes feelings of great shame and guilt. And so inviting somebody into the space where you, quote, feel most naked, and that's not just physical, but, but uh, in your mind and in your, your feelings and everything else. You don't want anybody else in there. But it needs to be done with others as well. And part of what you get there is people who believe you, people who understand you, people who stay with you, people who value you, people who give you dignity. It's all a reversal of the trauma when we do that. And the gift is hard and eyedropper sizes, but its value is frankly eternal. We know from the research that as time passes, trauma survivors actually end up carrying a smaller piece of the story than the whole thing, which is what they start out with. So as life goes on around them, eventually you, you sort of see them lift their heads and go, oh, it's a pretty day. You know, it's just, it's all been so internal for so long and you begin to see signs of that. It also leads to the idea of having choice about what am I going to do with this story? What am I going to do with the suffering that I have lived through and faced? And what can I do with that that is good? It could be really small, it could be for someone else, it could be all kinds of things. But, but it, it um, gives back agency. You know, I, I can't take away the abuse, but I can speak about it in a way that is helpful and supportive to others because I learned many things. So, three things. Thus, talking, tears, and time. It has to be all three. It's not just talking, and talking is repetitious. It's not just one time. And talking can be done in a way, of course, that does not include the heart. So sometimes, you know, you'll work with somebody and they'll tell you this story with no feelings at all. But eventually they learn how to tell it with their heart as well, which is a very vulnerable place to be and is also necessary for healing. 
And obviously time by itself isn't going to just help things because people keep it all inside and time passes and nothing changes. And so they're still a prisoner to the trauma. In recent years, there's been more and more exposure about abuse and trauma. If you told me at the beginning of my career, people would actually have conferences about these subjects. I, I would have worried about your sanity. <laughs> um, and of course, you don't have to look around very much in terms of the news globally, uh, or frankly, just in the US to see that uh, trauma is being done in the so-called house of God and uncovered by many. Um, and people are beginning to realize that actually keeping such things silent is not a virtue. Uh, it's actually a double vice. So if you, if you know about abuse going on somewhere and you don't want to tell because the person is famous or good, you think, or the institution or whatever else, um, silence contains indifference to the victims and complicity with the abusers. So we need to remember that. So unfortunately, the body of Christ has frequently failed to see trauma as a place of service and a place of truth. You know, we've been covering up these truths for so long for the sake of God's name, <laughs> the God who is truth. I mean, we, need, we need to think about that. The people of God is sometimes hidden in chapels and we worship and give money and sing and stick our heads out to tell everybody else what they're doing wrong. We have often blamed those who suffer from trauma. We have failed to recognize that the systems themselves, not just individuals, can be corrupt and power is abused and that like our Lord, many people in this world are suffering from totally undeserved injustice and trauma. You know, we've often thought, you know, well, this happened to you because you, which is diametrically opposed to the scriptures. What comes out of a man or woman comes from the heart of the man. It doesn't, doesn't come from anything out here. And so we have protected leaders and systems because this person had this thing happen to them and surely they did something to make it happen when in fact they were the true victim. So we have hidden in our chapels, I'm afraid, singing and worshiping just like Cape Coast Castle, collecting money for the unfortunate, sticking our heads out. But unlike our Lord, we have not gone down into the dungeons to where people are locked and where they are blinded by the lack of light and our hearts then are not like our God's. We prefer, you know, preserved our Cape Coast castle, but we have not looked like our God. So I know many of you are here because you don't want these things to happen and because you want to walk alongside those who have been abused in a way that is helpful to them and strengthens them and uh, brings life to them. So you are, many of you, I think, probably in positions of influence, power. You might not feel powerful, but if you have people that you influence, you have power. And so the question is, how are we going to walk alongside people who have less power and have been wounded often in the name of God? Um, you're here because you don't want to hide in the chapel. You're here because you want to walk with and help. But remember, listen, don't be seduced. The chapel is not a place. The chapel is actually a person. It's not a building, it's not a system. It's a head with a body. And he is the head and you and I are the body. And as in the physical realm, which I said at the beginning, a body that does not follow its head is a sick body. My father was a, a pilot in the Air Force, Drop paratroopers over Normandy, did all sorts of things, and had to retire eventually uh, when he was in his 40s because of neurological somethings that nobody could figure out at the time that were probably due to uh, what happened to him in North Africa before he went to Europe. 
And I remember coming home one year from college and he, we were talking in a room and he wanted some water and so I offered to get it for him because it took him forever to do it. And I went in the kitchen and poured the glass of water and I was coming back into the room and my father, who was 6'4 and a redhead, was trying to stand up by himself. And so I stayed where I was, I didn't go in the room. And I watched and he worked very hard at it, but he couldn't do it, and he finally sat back down. And I was probably 20 at the time, but the thought that went through my head was, at the time, a body that can't follow its head is a very sick body. I mean, his head knew exactly how to stand up. His head knew what to tell his body, but his body couldn't listen. And I did not know at the time, of course, how much that illustration would uh, affect my life as I often look out at the Christian world today and see the cover-ups and the denials and the lies and the hurting, hurting people who want to stand up. But the uh, church has often failed to follow her head in those areas. So when I use that phrase, it has a very deep meaning for me, but it, I, I think you know, it, was a, it came to me later when I began learning about these things, thinking, oh, that was not just about my father. You know, God was teaching me something. So our first call, you and I, is not a place. Our first call is not a human organization. Our first call is to one, and that's a person, above everything else. We're not called to dungeons, we're not called to caregiving, we're not called to any of those things first. Our first call is to love and obedience to him, no matter the cost. So to hearts that tolerate no dungeon corner, here or here. Throughout history, many have thought that if you avoid the dungeons of the world, you stay clean. Well, that would mean Jesus was quite filthy, which of course he did become for us, yes. But to do so is to fail to follow him, to stay away from what isn't clean is to fail to go with him. He went out into the dung heaps of this world, and he's called us to do the same. And many of you go, that's why you're here. But remember that the dungeon is not first out there, it's here. It's this dungeon that created all the ones out there and continues to create. So don't fool yourselves into thinking you follow a savior where others have failed to do so, because you will be creating a dungeon in yourself if you start thinking like that. So all the while, you know, we hide dungeons in our souls while we work externally in other dungeons. So you, dear bride of Christ, don't go to church. Don't attend church. Don't be busy with church. Be the church. Look like your master in your homes where nobody else sees, in your neighborhoods, in your nation, and around the world. Yes, go to the dung heaps, both internal and external. And let God transform you so that he can use you to transform this traumatized world and precious people that he loves who are suffering. Take up your part in the unfinished life of the risen Christ.